Welcome to the FaithBridge Sermon Podcast. We hope you're encouraged by the message. For more in-depth content and answers to questions submitted during the sermon, check out our podcast called Postscript. You can find it on iTunes or on our website at faithbridge.org forward slash podcast. Well, looks like uh, you all remember to turn your clocks and here you are at the early service. Welcome. Glad that you're here today. Why don't you take your Bibles and we'll go in 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter 4 in the New Testament. If you need a Bible, why don't you flag down the ushers and they'll be glad to let you borrow one of the uh, Bibles or you can keep it. Our gift to you if you could uh, benefit from that. So last week we started a series that we're going to do for several weeks. It's dealing with some of the realities of life and dealing with the good news that God has not abandoned us to ourselves to just sort of cope with these realities, but gives us wisdom in his word. And so we have to go to his word and draw the wisdom from it and apply it then into our lives. I want to continue that series today talking about a subject that is a reality to all of our lives. If not today, sometime in the past, sometime in the future. The topic is suffering. Have you ever found yourselves wondering why? You ever wondered why, God? I mean, when you see pictures of starving babies in other parts of the world, don't you find yourself going, why, God? You know, or somebody that you love gets cancer or dies, and you find yourself scratching your head saying, why? Or you hear about a, a, a terrorist group that, that snuffs out the life of a Christian, somebody who loved Jesus and was serving him in another part of the world, and you, and you just go, why, God? Well, I think that's what we need to talk about today. Now, let me make you a a promise here, okay? Because I know some of you are thinking, oh, you know, I like last week when you were were telling self-deprecating stories and you're being silly and aren't you going to do that? No, I'm going to do that so much today. But I guarantee you, if you'll stay with me, you'll be inspired by the end, okay, of what we're talking about. And you'll be equipped for the realities that come to all of our lives, Okay, so we're going to deal with this subject of suffering. Now, you you realize, I'm sure that you do realize, suffering is uh, perhaps one of the the biggest reasons that skeptics, agnostics, non-Christians, atheists uh, give as uh, their reason for not believing in God. It's it's the the line of logic goes like this: If God were all powerful, He could stop all suffering. And if God were all loving, he would stop suffering. But suffering has not been stopped. Therefore, an all good or all loving God must not exist. Now, at first hearing, it sounds like pretty tight logic, doesn't it? But suffering is a problem for the skeptic, for the atheist as well, you have to realize. Because if the reality of pain and suffering bring a person to the conclusion, there's no God, there just is absolutely no way there could be a God, then he or she has ruled out the possibility that the suffering could be God's fault. And there are problems with this line of logic as well. C.S. Lewis wrote, my argument against God was that the universe seemed so cruel and so unjust, but how had I gotten this idea that the world was cruel and unjust? What was I comparing this universe to when I called it unjust? See, if you're convinced that the natural world is unjust, if it's filled with evil and suffering, that it, then, then you're assuming the possibility of some higher standard by which you're making that evaluation. And so the skeptic has to answer the question, if I can tell the difference between evil and good, how did I get that ability? Who gave me that ability to tell the, dis- the difference? Dostoevsky wrote, if God did not exist, then everything is permitted. He says, if there's no God, then you might feel like this or that is wrong or unjust, but there's no higher standard or giver of that standard by which you're making your assessment. It's just personal feelings. And so you might feel like terrorism is wrong, but if there's no God, on what basis? Everything is permitted. 
So the subject of pain and suffering, it's hard for the Christian, but it's hard for the skeptic, for the atheist alike to explain. Now we could spend the rest of the time talking about the whys of suffering further, but I don't think that's going to help us uh, because you have to move on from the why to the how. So how are we going to deal with it? This past week, one of my little guys uh, got a little stomach bug, had to miss a school for a couple of days. Now, Suzanne and I could have just asked ourselves endlessly, why did this happen? Why? Was it little Herbie that he got playing with? Or was it Larissa that he was playing with? How, why did he get this? That's not going to do us any good. You got to move on to the how. How are we going to deal with this now that it's here? Okay? And, and that's how it is with suffering. Now, I'm not saying that was great suffering. In fact, he thought that was pretty neat that he got to miss school. But I'm just saying we got to move from the why to the how. And for this, I want us to look at the passage, a passage that comes from 1 Peter, okay? 1 Peter chapter 4, drawing some insights from one of Jesus' closest disciples, this man Peter, who, who shadowed Jesus for three years closely and would go on and be one of the leading disciples, leading apostles, spreading uh, initial Christianity into the world. And he would write this letter, First Peter, to Christians who were being persecuted. And it was rough, not unlike the way it seems to be getting in some parts of the world right now with terrorism. And Christians were getting snuffed out. And, you know, all sorts of gruesome ways 2,000 years ago. And he's writing to them and he's saying, hey, let me help you to realize something. That, that when it comes to suffering, you... you you, it's, it's, it's not just about surviving, but you can actually utilize the suffering. It's not just about getting through it, but you, you can actually use it to come out refined and even bigger hearted than before. And here's the reality. You don't have to be suffering at the hand of a terrorist to, to, to be able to benefit from the counsel that he's giving here. It's counsel that works for anybody who is suffering. Okay, let's look at what he says. First Peter chapter four, starting at verse 12. Dear friends, he says, don't be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice in as much as you participate in the sufferings of Christ. So you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. If you're insulted because of the name of Christ, you're blessed. For the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. If you suffer, it shouldn't be as a murderer or a thief or any kind of criminal or even a meddler. However, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name. Jump down to verse 19. So then, those who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves to their faithful creator and continue to do good. Now, look at this verse in 12. Um, you might circle the words fiery ordeal. Those words come from a Greek word, purosis. It's the word that sounds like purify to us, right? And that's the meaning. Physically, you see, when you put metal ore into the fire, the metal ore contains both the pure and the impure, the, the pure metal and the dross. Both are, are co-mingled and you can't tell where one stops and one starts. In normal temperature, they just all meld together. So why do they put it into the fire? They put it in the fire because the fire creates separation. And the pure can handle the fire, but the dross, the impure, can't. The true handles the fire and the false can't. And so the fire separates the two, separates them out. I heard a story uh, about a silversmith who was asked, how long do you leave the metal, the silver, in the fire? How do you know when it's been in there long enough? And the silversmith said, I know it's been in there long enough when I can see the reflection of my face in the silver. So perhaps in a roundabout way, God is our divine silversmith, allowing us to go through fires until his face is reflected in ours more completely. 
Peter likens it to a furnace that you put gold or silvers into. And, and one time this really happened in the Bible. You remember back in Daniel 3 in the Old Testament, it, it literally happened with some believers. You had these guys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And they had been carted off into a foreign land, but they believed in God and they loved him. And, and King Nebuchadnezzar had come along and he'd set up a great image and says, everybody must bow down and you must worship this image when you hear the music. And Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego, and they were gonna bow down and worship a false god because they worshiped the one true God. And so they get arrested and they get tied up and King Nebuchadnezzar says, throw them into the fiery furnace and heat the fiery furnace so much, seven times I think it was hotter. And it was so hot the, the, the furnace was that the people who, who threw Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego into the fire ended up dying because of the heat. But once they're in the fire, you remember the story in Daniel 3. Nebuchadnezzar looks in and he sees not three people, but he sees four people. And he leaps to his feet and says, wait a second, didn't we throw three people, didn't we bind three people up and throw three people in the fire? And now I see four people walking around there, unbound, unharmed. And the fourth looks like the son of God. How'd the story end? Well, we know that they came out. Those three came out unharmed. But only three came out. So who was in there with them? Remember Isaiah 43? God tells us, fear not, I've redeemed you. When you pass through the waters, I will be there. When you walk through the fire, you'll not be burned. Neither shall the flame kindle upon you. Now, what's the promise that he was giving to his believers? The promise was never, 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 never. If you belong to me, you won't ever go through deep waters. If you belong to me, you'll never go through fiery trials. That was never the promise. He doesn't say that. He doesn't even say, if you go through those things. He says, when. When you go through them, I will be with you. When you're plunged into the fiery furnace, God says, I'll so care about you and I'll so love with you that you will feel my love and my presence with you. It'll be like I'm walking with you through it. And if you sense me walking with you through it, you won't be consumed by it. It won't consume you, it will refine you. So back to the text in 1 Peter. Three observations I wanna make from the text today if you're taking notes, okay? The first one is this. First, he says in verse 12, don't be surprised. He says, don't be surprised. Don't be surprised at the fiery ordeal that's come on you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. Don't be surprised by this. Now, what did he mean by this? I'll tell you what he didn't mean, just so we get this very clear. He didn't mean don't grieve. He didn't mean that at all. Peter never says, don't grieve. He doesn't say that. It's normal that you will cry. It's expected that you will weep. In fact, Tim Keller points out, who, who I'm borrowing several thoughts from today, he says, he says, it's quite normal that you will grieve. But the key is you mustn't be surprised because you'll never handle suffering well if it keeps surprising you when it happens as if, as if you're saying, how could this be happening to me? I gave my life to God. I trusted in Christ. I'm trying to be a good person. I'm trying to follow him. I thought he loved me. What is going on? No, 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 we, no, no. We, can't, we cannot let ourselves be surprised by this. We have to think like the refiner. And the refinement can't happen without the fire. Or think like a parent. That's another um, analogy or metaphor that, that is used in scripture. Anybody who's a parent, you know this y yourselves. You, you can't bring up little snotty-nosed critters into refined grown-ups without some refinement, right? And along the way, they're gonna look at you and say, you're so cruel. You're such a bad mom. You're such a bad dad. You don't love me. You know that if you've been a parent, right? You've heard that, but you know the truth. Of course I love you, kid. Trust me. This is gonna help you do better in life, okay? 
So you have to think like the parent. You have to think like the, the refiner. What will sink us, it's not the grief. It's okay to grieve it when we're in it. It's normal. We just, we just got to get beyond being shocked or being surprised by it. He told us we will suffer trials and tribulations. And in fact, for this reason, he tells us in verse 13, so rejoice in as much as you participate in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. He's not saying be happy about it. He's not saying be happy that you're suffering. He's not saying you gotta be a masochist. He's not saying rejoice because you're in pain. He's not saying that. He's saying rejoice because as a Christian, just as the sufferings of Christ gave him the name above all names, you're in the same pattern now. You're walking in the same shoes. You're making progress. Rejoice that you're in good company with Christ who also suffered. See, the problem is that our hearts are a mixture. They're a mixture of allegiances. We would like to think they're not. We tend to, 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 to believe, you know, I trust in God. He's my everything. He's my all in all. I love to sing the songs and worship in God. It's just God and Jesus. I just, it's just all about God. We believe that, really. But in fact, there's a lot of other things intertwined with that. For example, you have no idea how much your career means to you until one day you lose your job. Or you lose your marriage. Or you lose a child. Or you lose a dream. And it's gone. And in that moment, you're falling. And suddenly, everything is cut out from under you. And in that situation, now... We're really going to find out how much do we really trust in God? How much now? See, until the bad circumstances come, it's easy for two things to live together. It's only in the furnace of suffering that we discover what really we're trusting in. So we mustn't be surprised. That's the first thing he says. Second thing he says, obey. You see that in verse 15. If you suffer, he says, it shouldn't be as a murderer or a thief or any kind of criminal or even a meddler. If you're suffering, he's saying, never let it be because of the choices that you're making. Never let it be because of your sin or your disobedience. Stay faithful. But that's, that's a particularly hard when we're suffering, isn't it? And when we're weak, it's easy to grow disobedient in those seasons. When you're going through troubles, I've just seen this happen before. It's very easy for people to stop praying. It's very easy for people to stop worshiping, to stop coming to church, to stop serving. Why? Because they, they grow so consumed with, with the, their own goings on, with their own troubles. And it's easy in those situations to turn our back on God and just, and, and worse, to give in to escape sins, those sins that even if just for a few moments bring a, a momentary temporal sense of relief from the pain. They give us a, just a brief high. But God says, oh, no, 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 no. Don't do that. We have a hard time enduring obediently when we're under trial because we have a hard time believing that God is still in control and that he still really loves us. Gary Thomas <clears throat> tells the story of a, of a Christian lady whose name was Leslie and she was married to, to Tim and they'd been married for 11 years and uh, by every indication a, a strong Christian couple but in their 11th year, she found herself sensing that Tim was slipping away. She even confided in a friend or two. And they said, oh, no, that's just your imaginings. You all have a great marriage. 
he loves you. He's a great husband. He's training to be an elder in our church. And I, no, that's, that's not the case. But her fears were realized. Not long after, he went on a business trip and he didn't come back when expected. And one hour goes by and two and three and four, no word, no mention, no phone, no nothing. Six, seven, eight, nine. The plane had already landed. Everything was fine. Finally, she hears some commotion down in the garage, runs out into the garage, sees him throwing his golf clubs into the trunk of his car. She says, Tim, where have you been? I've been worried. And then he says those fateful words to her, I don't love you, Leslie. He said, I haven't loved you for a long time. He said, we're, we're not right for each other. And I'm leaving. I'm tired of living a lie, he says. And in that moment, her world is rocked. She held it together in front of him, but when she was alone, dissolved, wept. Friends came over and prayed with her and wept with her and wept with her and prayed with her. And she fought off uh, you know, cynicism, wrestled with some depression, even with fear, uh, especially as his next wedding date got nearer and nearer. But she describes the situation. She describes a season in, of pain when she was going through it and she would find herself crying out to the Lord. She would feel the Lord's hands as if on her face, just holding her face saying, Leslie, Leslie, look at me. Look at me, not him. She would say, oh, but if I hadn't done this or if I'd done more of that, he wouldn't have left me. It's all my fault. And he would, he, she would sense him saying, Leslie, I loved him perfectly, and he's left me too. She remained faithful even in his unfaithfulness, and she wore her ring right up until the day he remarried. Leading up to that time, friends had, had said, why don't you move on? Go ahead and have some dates, and, and let's get on with life. And she, she masked the shock that she felt that they were so eager for her to move on from this with grace and persevered in her faithfulness until that day he went forward with his choices. Now, here's the interesting part of the story. Two years go by. <clears throat> and she talks about what happened then. Two years later, her father, Leslie's father, called her. And he said, Leslie, I've watched what you've gone through the last two years. And I've watched how you've responded. And I've seen how you've reacted. And I want what you have inside of you. Now, this was so significant because Leslie's father had done the very same thing to her mother. He had left her when she was a girl. So there was all this residual pain and all that's that coming up at this. She meets up with him in a hotel room at age 62. She explains the story of God's love, the gospel, that God. While we were yet sinners, God came to this earth and lived a perfect life that we couldn't live and died the death of suffering that we all deserve to die and then rose victorious. And, and she explained that to him. He'd heard the gospel a bazillion times, but only now was it finally making sense. Why? Because he'd seen the gospel lived out in her, in her seasons of suffering. And so she would write, how, how can I not smi smile now? To think of that night when I got to lead my 62-year-old dad to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And from there, he will go into all eternity. How can I not thank God if Tim's leaving me can somehow lead other people towards Jesus Christ, then I'm willing to endure that. If you're suffering, Peter says, never let it be 
because of your own sin or your own disobedience. Stay faithful. Stay faithful. Don't sabotage what he might be doing because you can't see what else is in the mix and what else he might be doing. So in the meantime, what? At least to the last thing, verse 19. Look at verse 19. So then, those who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves to their faithful creator and continue to do good. That's the third thing. Commit yourself to him. What does it mean to commit? It means to make a deposit. Now, you only make a deposit in a bank that you trust in, right? So why can you make a deposit into God? Why can you trust God? Why can you say, Lord... I don't know what's going on here, but I'm trusting you. Here's why. Because he's the only one who can really walk with you through the fire. And he's the only one who will ultimately eliminate all the fire and all the suffering. See, just because he hasn't eliminated yet doesn't mean that he can't or that he won't. The Bible says clearly, oh no, he will. He will finally eliminate all suffering and all evil. The day is going to come, the Bible says, in which he's gonna wipe it all out. So that begs the question, well, why does he wait then? Come on, let's be done with it. Well, here's why. Look at what Peter wrote in his second letter, verse 310. The Lord isn't really being slow about his promise to return, as some people think. No, he's being patient for your sake. He doesn't want anybody to perish, so he's giving more time for everyone to repent. But the day of the Lord will come, and the earth and everything on it will be exposed to judgment. See, he's waiting to give more people the opportunity to come and to trust in him and to give their lives over to him, to step onto the ark, if you will, of salvation through Jesus Christ. Because you can't separate evil deeds from evil doers. So on that dreadful day, when he comes, when he returns and when he wipes out all the evil deeds, he will also wipe out all the evil doers who have not come into that ark of salvation through Jesus Christ. And C.S. Lewis says, when that day comes, it won't be a day for choosing anymore, not that day. At that point, only what has been chosen will be revealed. But by waiting, he's giving sufficient time for the likes of me and the likes of you to come to a saving faith in him. So in the meanwhile, while we suffer, let me leave you with one thought. It gives me comfort to remember that God himself knows what it feels like to suffer. Now follow this. See, none of the other religions of the world talk about a God like this. All the other religions of the world have some wisdom, some bits of truth in them. But only in Christianity do we find a God who said, I'll suffer. 2 Corinthians 5.9 Paul says, for God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. This is the wonderful message he's given us to tell others. So when you're suffering and when there's pain in your life, listen to the voice of the Lord speak back to you. I know what it feels like. I know what it feels like to be forsaken, to be betrayed. I've walked that path. Hear him say, back to you, I know what it feels like to be beaten, to be spat upon. I know what that feels like. Hear him say, I know what it feels like to die a painful, agonizing death. I've even been there and done that. Hear him say, hear the heavenly father say I know what it feels like even to lose your only child and to watch him die I've done that 
See, God did not exempt himself from the pain and the suffering of this world. He said, oh, no, no, I'll come into this world because my redemption can only happen if I come into this world and if I play by the same rules that everybody has to play by. And therefore, he says, I suffer too. He knows what it feels like. He walks on wounded feet. The risen Christ does. So even though the cross doesn't tell us why, why am I suffering? It tells us what the answer isn't. It can't be that he doesn't love us. It can't be that he doesn't care. It can't be any of those things because he came and he plunged himself into the fiery furnace of our sufferings and not just the sufferings that you and I go to, through or even other people, people in other parts of the world who have it perhaps even worse. He took on a suffering far more exponential than he took on the sufferings of the whole world and all of the pain and all of the sin and all of the evil onto himself. Jesus Christ suffered more than we'll ever understand. Now, here's why this is relevant. Suppose we could get in a time machine right here today and go backwards in time to the foot of the cross. Okay? 2,000 years. And there we are at the foot of the cross. And there's Mary. And there's John, and there's the, they're weeping and crying and, and the thunder. And they're like, oh my gosh, here we are in this scene. And you see them weeping and crying. And you hear them saying to one another, I can't believe it's over. Look at, look at what he was doing. Look at what, he, I mean, he was bringing r- r- redemption. He was changing this world. He was driving evil out of Palestine. He was dealing with the inhumanities Right here in our culture, he was healing people. He was spreading hope. His teaching was amazing. And now it's all over. If you and I were transported through time, it'd be all we could do not to say, oh, but trust me, I know how this story goes. This is the low point moment. But he's going to get buried, and, and then in three days, he's going to rise, and he's going to have fish by the seashore with you, Peter, and he's going to restore you, and then you're going to go on. You're going to have a great life. In fact, people are going to like read books in the Bible that you write, because th- I've been there, but they wouldn't understand that. But you'd want to say that. You'd want to say, oh, trust me, there's a bigger, grander picture that's going on here than you can see. Now, that advice makes total sense to you if you were giving it to people back then. What we have to do is bring it around and let the saints who've gone before us, talked about in Hebrews 12, 1, who are in the bleachers of heaven cheering for us, say back to us in our moments of suffering, trust us. You're going to make it. This is the low point, but there's a bigger, grander picture. So press on. Don't give up. Stay close to Jesus. And you will make it. Let's pray together. God, none of us likes the thought of suffering. In fact, we spend a lot of time and energy trying to figure out how to make life as comfortable and unsuffering as we can. The advertisements we hear on the TV and the radio and computer and everything, are they're, they're all trying to tell us ways that we could suffer a little bit less, feel a little bit better. And yet, we know that the realities of this world include the reality that all of us will suffer. Some of us in this place right here today are hurting very deeply. 
There's been a loss. There's been a diagnosis. There's great pain. Others of us are feeling almost a vicarious sense of pain for a a friend or a relative who is in that season, even as we've heard these words today. Still others of us, we say, I don't really, everything is kind of going pretty well for me right now. But Lord, we know that sooner or later, all of us, we all go through the fire and you bring good from it. And we wouldn't want to stay snotty-nosed little kids. We want to be brought up into maturity where your face is reflected in our face. So now, in this moment, I'm just going to invite you to talk to the Lord yourself. I'm just going to grow quiet because I have a feeling that you have your own thoughts that you would like to just talk, maybe just to pour out to him yourself. So in the quietness of this moment, why don't you just talk with him? Tell him what you're feeling. Tell him what you're fearing. Hear him whisper his word of assurance back to you, though. Why don't you do that just right now? I pray that you would bring healing. I pray that you would bring hope. I pray that you would bring strength. I pray that you would bring life. I pray that you would bring perspective. I pray, God, that you'd give us an outlook, that the, the reminder that there's always something bigger and grander going on when you're in the mix than we can see in this moment. Help us to keep our eyes on you, Jesus as all the great saints of the faith have throughout history. Help us to hear their cheers from the bleachers of heaven, those people who've gone before us, who've suffered perhaps worse than we have. Help us to draw strength as we run our race now. We ask all of these things in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. Welcome to Postscript from Faithbridge Church. Here we hope to answer your questions and help you dig deeper into the message by sitting down with the teacher of the day. Hello, my name is Adam McIntyre, and I am the high school pastor here at Faithbridge, and I am sitting with Pastor Ken, who just gave an incredible sermon on suffering. Pastor Ken, thank you so much for being here. Sure, thank you. So, uh, I love the sermon, and I have a few questions uh, from it. Do you think that, as Christians, we should expect more suffering Mm. because of our call to go out into the world and into the darkness? Sure. Well, yeah, I probably two things come to mind with that question. The first is, if we are living such an insulated, uh, protected life that there seldom is any Mm -hmm. suffering, the, the question probably needs to be asked, are we entering into the world enough, as Jesus told us to go into the world? Um, then another thought comes to mind, that being, it would appear in this day and age, uh, you know, as forces against Christianity heighten in other parts of the world and even in our part of the world, uh, there may be some more coming our direction. And so uh, probably good for us to keep that 12th verse in mind. Don't be surprised um, as we go. Yeah, absolutely. And in your sermon, you gave uh, three different 
observations of the first Peter text that you went through. And in your second observation, uh, it was obedience and that uh, we need to be obedient even in the midst of our suffering. And then you told an incredible story about Leslie and Tim and, and Leslie having to suffer through a very difficult divorce. Um, but as a result of her faithfulness in the midst of that suffering, her father actually saw the gospel come alive in her life. Right. And so my question is, what is it about obedience and faithfulness in the midst of suffering that helps to make the gospel come alive for others to see? Yeah, it, well, it's the winsome witness. It's the authenticity. It, it is the, the, the realization that onlookers have that the pure metal is really what characterizes your life, not the dross. We've seen people who suffer and they just, their life just tanks and there's nothing inspirational about that at all. It's, it's pitiable. Um, but when we see somebody who, who is anchored in their faith, there is a, a genuine uh, winsomeness and authenticity that is contagious and inspiring and draws us towards them. And, and what, what is it? Well, it's all of those things. It's, it's uh, in Philippians, it's the peace that surpasses all understanding. We see how could you be peaceful? That makes no sense to me whatsoever. It surpasses all understanding what you're demonstrating. And... So I think all of those things rolled in together uh, m make f for a very compelling witness. That's great. And uh, kind of a related question, um, do you think that Christians then have actually a responsibility to go out into the world and help alleviate the sufferings of the world? And what, sure. what would that kind of look like? And how would we do that? Yeah, right. sure. Well, so several thoughts come to mind. First of all, the answer, of course, is yes. So how do we, do we do that? First, I think we get more serious about prayer and concentrated prayer times for certain people groups in other parts of the world, in our part of the world, for victims of this or that, um, and going to God in the spiritual realm, praying, first of all, that there would be darkness pushed back. And then, secondly, we got to roll our sleeves up and go into the, the, get into the action of helping to push the darkness back. I was talking to a guy uh, not very long ago who came back from one of our mission trips that go out from Faith Bridge, of which we have several dozen each year, counting the, the student ministry and the adult teams that go out. And his, in particular, had been a water well digging mission for seven or ten days and he just was going on and on and on and on out the hallway he just couldn't stop talking about how, just the joy it brought him to see the water come in and just to just to sense that the darkness was being pushed back and, and provision was being brought forth from his being part of the team and so there's something very powerful about actually saying I want to step into mission and have a missional life and not just be living a selfish, self-focused sort of life. And then one other thought comes to mind to give credit to, to giving credit to my wife. A lady came up to me right after the sermon was over and gave me a hug and she said, you left out one thing from your sermon. I said, oh, what was it? And she said, well, you have to have a Suzanne Werlein in your life. Now, I knew because of this person, and I knew the pain that she had gone through, and I knew the season she was talking about, and she said, you know, Suzanne, when, I, when my faith was really fragile, and I just wasn't really sure, Suzanne was always there speaking words of reassurance and love and comfort and holding me while I cried, and she would remind me at the right times about passages like the one you preached from today. And so just having, you know, an, an encourager in seasons of suffering is, is priceless. So one of the ways that we can help to apply this is in seasons when we're not, uh, when our band, bandwidth isn't being used up in the suffering, we can move towards those who are. 
and be the shoulder that they can cry on and be the arm that can hold them and help them through you know, a season. So I think that's another very practical way that we can move out and, and help in the realities of suffering in the world. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you so much again, Ken, for being here with us. And thank you all for tuning in, and we will see you next week. Thanks for joining us for Postscript. Help us keep the podcast interactive by submitting your questions during the morning services. Learn more at faithbridge.org forward slash postscript.